So how many of you all have heard of this place called Banargatta? Do you know what Banargatta means? Okay, so you're saying that Banargatta, if you go to Banargatta, you see animals that are in captivity. In fact, may I use that word? Sort of, okay, okay. Semi-captive? Okay, great. Okay, so, so keeping that thought in mind, don't, don't slip off that Banargatta thought. Let me come back to my talk. So I call my talk as, well, I was asked uh, by Karishma and team to stick to this month's theme called the context. And it's a very interesting theme and I was trying to figure myself as to how I can talk in context to the context of creative mornings this month. So my context will be about identity in context of say the elephant or, or, or the context of Bangalore or in the context of what I'm going to speak about elephants. So I'm talking about managing a mammal, a huge big mammal like the elephant in a metropolitan city. So I title my talk as the postcode elephants. Now this is a, a very cynical term. Now what is a postcode? What does a postcode generally refer to? It means there is a sense of identity. A lot of my work uh, has been in villages and it continues to be in villages. So I, I stay out of uh, a national park and my office is there and most of my work, I'm glad that some of my colleagues are there, Jay Shankar is there, Dilip is there and all of us pretty much do a lot of work in villages. And when we go to villages, the first thing that we ask is, you have elephants, especially around Banalgata National Park, you have a lot of elephants. And the immediate response that we get from villagers are they, they don't like them because there are several reasons. And then there is the forest department. I'm sure that most of the forests in this country are managed by the Ministry of Environment and Forests. So forests are managed by them. And when we ask them about elephants, they don't own them. They say we don't want them. So my elephants that I study don't have a sense of identity. Okay. No one wants them, you know, the, the people don't want them because of certain reasons, the forest department don't want them because of again another set of reasons. So, so I feel that some of the elephants that I study don't have a sense of identity, okay, but they're very much prevalent in our society, they're very much part of Bangalore. Can we all by the end of this talk own these elephants? Can we give a sense of identity to them and say that yes, they are part of us? Can you see these names highlighted? You know, Raudi Ranga, Raudi Ranga, Siddha. They are also on social media. So this is like a conundrum. So I was talking about my elephants not having an identity. And then you find them all over the place. They are on the news. They have their own hashtag, like hashtag Siddha. You know? Like what is that? And then you probably have photographs, save the Ranga elephant, save Namma Siddha. So they are very much prevalent in, 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 at least in the context of Bangalore. But why are these elephants not wanted by anyone? Why are these elephants not revered or accepted by the so-called populace of, of Bangalore? Next. Well, it's always good to understand a, a fair background about the subject that we're dealing with. Having worked with elephants for so long and I still believe very honestly that I don't know much about them. A quick snippet of how this so-called culture which translated into elephant knowledge and literature and science. So the first book that pretty much existed in, in terms of culture and folklore was a very fine book that was written by Eddington. It talks about the elephant in the context of the culture, the, the, the Lord Ganesh and its reverence and the sage Palkapya who is in some sense the true elephant conservationist of our time. Until 1997 when Nadir Desai spoke about behavior about elephants because by now we have close to about four decades of knowledge on the elephant scientifically and of course we've had an association with the animal for more than about 1000 to 2000 years. So this is something that you would probably want to read if you like elephants, these are very exhaustive books. And this is a very interesting photograph that was clicked in Jerusalem, I think this was uh, an elephant trying to attack a feline, this goes back 1600 year, years ago. And then you have another photograph where the Mughals, at that time, these, these animals operated as war machines. You can see that bull attacking a, a horse and you can notice that he's leaking in the tem tem temples, you know. It's always associated that bull elephants, when they're in heat or in must, they tend to be more aggressive. So that's a very classical painting way back in the 16th, 17th century. So what I'm trying to say is that we've, whether we like it or not, uh, it's a fact that we have to believe that today we've had at least about close to 2000 years of, of our association with the elephant, okay, at least in the Indian context. And this is the only true species that is from India, you know, a species that, of course, we had two species which one ended up in Africa, one ended up in Asia. But if you have to really literally say the only wildlife in India that is truly native to this landscape is the Indian elephant. 
Okay, now, so quickly to understand what, what with the little that I know of elephants, what they do. So this is a beautiful shot in Banargata. It's a beautiful lake. And then just outside the gallery forest, in the bamboo understory, you have these group of elephants coming and drinking water. Now, nothing, nothing to explain elephant biology by just looking at this photograph. So what is this elephant about? What does it do? How much does it eat? What does it need? What is its daily requirements next? So they need about 100 to 150 kgs of green fodder. In, in tropical dry deciduous forest where I come from, they feed to about 67 species of vegetation. Well, they need about 100 to 200 liters of water. That's how much they need for their metabolic needs. Shelter, otherwise rest or discourse, is just about four to five hours. So if you've ever seen an elephant, in any context, you'll probably see them feeding all the time, right? Have you seen an elephant doing anything else? No, they'll only be feeding or drinking water. So the forage species are largely selected on two types. So they only feed on, on, on green fodder that has nutrient value and in some cases they also look at palatability. And because they have poor term thermoregulation me thermoregulatory mechanism, which means unlike us, they can't sweat. Well, they don't have sweat glands, so they need to constantly keep themselves cold by spraying water on themselves or drinking water. Different for different seasons, because in a forest ecosystem, these resources are not standard, unlike us in a society where you can just call up someone and get some food. So elephants have to constantly uh, keep moving in order to get these resources next. So let's look at their families, you know, how they are structured and, you know, look at their social organization. So this is probably a herd or a family group. So let's try and decipher this family group. So elephants are matriarchal, which means that they're largely led by the oldest female, which means the, the knowledge of that family is rested in that individual female. So which means decision making, governing, foraging area, seasonality, all of that is decided by that one individual, primarily because of the experience that she has. And the males are just largely limited to reproduce, or rather reduced to reproduce, which means that they are kept in the, in the family for a certain age till they are sexually mature and after that the oldest female says please go away. This is a brilliant way of preventing inbreeding, it's nature's way of saying go away because otherwise you will have the male end up mating with a full sister or, or sometimes in cases in captivity you see that the son always tries to mate with the mother. So they live in a multi-tiered social organization structure which means you have several females uh, largely governed by the matriarch, you have a sister, you have a aunt, you have a cousin and it's linear. So based on the group size you have different classifications, you call them clan, you call them herd. Well in the African context these numbers increase. So, but the basic unit of an elephant society is the mother and the calf because that's how it starts. If we call ourselves social, what is the strategy, what is the benefit of being in a group? Largely to avoid predation in the context of an elephant. Or in the other societal context is largely for protection. We live with our family primarily because we get protection, we get support and goes on, you know, in the human kind. And there is also a very uh, interesting part because in, in a social species it's about, always is about the child, it's always about taking care of the young one. And in many cases, well this is debatable, we also see allo mothering, which means that if there are two lactating females with two calves, you can have one mother feeding both the calves, you know, despite not having, not being the own child. So all these things are largely to improve survival chances in order to ensure that the best individual is achieved in the population. In the Asian elephant, I'm sure many of you all know, the males have tusks, the females don't have tusks. So that's one of the features in which we differentiate between male to female. And also you have something known as a makna, which is a male elephant without tusks. So this is, well again, these are quite challenging in field conditions to identify because the tusk is nothing but the incisor teeth, so it's pretty much there in both, both male and female, just that in the male it's much more prominent, unlike that of the female. So in the Asian elephant, there's also a report that the degree of relatedness is less because they might not be genetically related to each other to a larger degree compared to the African cousins, primarily because most of these population of elephants that we, are, we have in India are all reduced population. So there's not much of genetic exchange, this is largely due because of the kind of fragmentation the forests have gone through, especially in elephant landscapes. When you're looking at calving, uh, well, they have a long gestation period for about 18 to 24 months, sometimes to some extent it goes to more than two years. And they have an intercalving interval about four to five years, which means that mother gives birth to a calf, the calf suckles for about two years, then another two years, and then the female is ready to, you know, give birth again. So 
in elephants the females give birth till they die so there's no question of menopause like we have in our societies and again a very short in estrus just in about 2 to 3 days when the female is receptive and only then they conceive so looking at an animal of this complexity but if you look at its reproduction reproductive strategy i would rate it as very poor so for for an elephant in order to perpetuate and survive it's quite a challenge by the very virtue of its existence so that's a classification so you can see those colors there so that's a adult female i would assume that to be the matriarch then the other adult female would be the full sister the green one would be a sub adult female daughter probably the daughter of the full sister and the juvenile male could be the son of the matriarch and then you have a calf we don't know the sex of it because sometimes it's very hard to sex calves so like us so i might be drawing parallels to us so please don't get offended but i'm just trying to make it much more easy to understand uh, so so let's look at the elephant profile you know the elephant profile is pretty much like us so very very uh, in, in 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 the commonest sense we tend to look at elephants like their livestock you know all of them look the same they move together they just nothing like sheep but looking at these photographs you can actually make out individuals so they like us they have identity some of us are dark some of us are fair some of us have brown hair and you can clearly make out that there are certain distinguishing features between both of them and then you have the male which the most distinguishing feature is the tusk the presence or the absence of the tusk so 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 what i'm trying to say is that elephants can be identified individually they also behave very individually or individualistically well how do you classify them pretty much in field conditions we use height as a standard reference of course there are other body morphological features that can be used to age an elephant so pretty much you can see three classes of elephants there that's an adult female based on height which is probably about 7 feet and then you have the juvenile male and then you have a a, a juvenile female so we always take uh, this is sort of the photograph they are trying to look at standard referencing on how we use height as a factor to classify elephants but this again cannot be done with wild elephants so we use structures like that check dam step there where we can you know relate the height and probably gauge the age of the elephant so these are important tools for us to understand what this animal is all about of course if you have to know someone you need to know how old they are whether they male or female what are they doing so it's pretty much important that we understand elephants at this capacity next so if you know the indian subcontinent down south the elephants are distributed across the country then you have the southern population which is that beautiful landscape which spread across three states of karnataka tamil nadu and kerala this is called the brahmagiri nilagiri eastern ghats landscape it starts as from brahmagiri goes up so it's like a big u so this is a very important landscape it's about close to 15000 square kilometer in area and this is probably the only place in india that can you know ensure the future survival of elephants we have close to about say about 13000 elephants in this landscape and then look at the map on the right so you have the southern population which goes further down towards the western ghats i don't know sure. if you can look at the western side and then you have these broken hills and then you have the gap between the northern northern western ghats and the southern western ghats which go further into agastya malai peria landscape and then you have on the landscape towards the central east which is pretty much your orissa chatisgarh bihar and that area and then you have the northeastern landscape which is your assam sikkim mizoram and those areas then you have the northwestern landscape between uttarakhand uttaranchal and of course we have elephants moving into himachal even now so this is pretty much the distribution of the elephants across the country so my work has largely to do with this landscape the 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 nilagiri the brahmagiri nilagiri eastern ghat landscape if you can just press next so the landscape that i work is there so it's the northernmost tip of the eastern ghats in the state of karnataka and that's that's probably the end of the eastern ghats in southern india after that well the eastern ghats go up to orissa but this contiguous track of the eastern ghats stops at banarghata national park so it's pretty much a very important habitat at least in terms of defining the elephant range and like i said this landscape is typically a tropical dry deciduous forest and i said it holds the largest population of asian elephant not only the asian elephant but also the tiger so you have close to about 400 tigers that operate in that area so it's a very very important site for conservation of these two charismatic species next now coming to the landscape that i work so we are in bangalore so you can see bangalore on the map 
South of Bangalore, just about 20 kilometers from here, is the Banargata National Park. Now, many of you all say Banargata is a place where animals are kept in cages. It's not. So, very often Banargata gets confused with a zoo, which is called the Banargata Biological Park. I'm talking about a protected area network, which is intact forest, which has wild animals. So, so this is the landscape that I work in. It's, it's, so if you look at the map, it's very funny. It looks like a monkey's tail. It's highly fragmented, primarily because you have Bangalore city so close to it. The northern part of Bang northern part of Banargata National Park is very much by the Bangalore municipal limits. It's about 260 square kilometers in area, and it is contiguous to the south to other protected areas in the state of Tamil Nadu and the state of Karnataka, Kaveri wildlife towards the east. Uh, in Tamil Nadu called the North Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary and then towards the West, the Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary. And the landscape is abound by the leopard, the Indian leopard, the dole or the Indian wild dog, the gore, which is a very important, uh, for, uh, very important grazer in tropical dry deciduous forests. Then you have the sambar, which is another deer, which is a very important prey species for the tiger. Then you have the cheetah, which is a spotted deer, again a, a grazing species. The tiger and the honey badger. Now, I may want to say this that this is perhaps the only national park in the world that has a wild tiger and a wild elephant so close to a protected area, or so close to a metropolitan city. Nowhere else, nowhere else in the world would you find these two charismatic animals that are the flagship for conservation so close to Bangalore. How many of you knew this? So, we're looking at these two species competing with 8 million people and in a roughly about 700 square kilometer area. This is Bangalore city being the third populous city. So you can imagine the kind of treasures that could exist on this important, important uh, landscape, uh, an important ecosystem. So that's Banargata National Park. Coming to the elephants that, that I've been studying, so this is based on the project elephant results. We've been, collect, we've been conducting population estimation exercise which Dr. Jayashank and Dilip are very actively part of. So we've had a stable population since 2002, going up till 2012. We've also recently launched the results of 2017 elephant census, but it's not complete. So I've used the past estimates. So the sex ratio is very important. So it has a sex ratio of 1 to 2, which is fairly indicative of a very good population. You know, it's probably the it's the observed sex ratio, not the operation, indicating that the ratio between male to female is fairly balanced. And among the least skewed, because if you go to fancy national parks like Nagarole and places like that, your sex ratios go up to 1 is to 30, clearly indicating that something is wrong with the population. So there's only one male for 30 females. And then you have a, an intercarving inter interval which is less than 5 years, which, which means that the population is actually breeding and a birth rate of say about 2.2 calves a year, which is pretty much quite good, despite the kind of challenges that these animals go through. And you have a group structure representation where there's adults largely occupies the larger chunk of the population, which is again indicative of the fact that the elephants are doing really well to some extent. So now what is the problem? Human elephant conflict? I'm sure you must have been aware that you know animals go through a lot of challenges, there's poaching, there's habitat fragmentation. But we also realize that in the 21st century, the biggest challenge for the conservation of Asian elephant is, is this is the human elephant conflict. Now this is emerging to be number one, where maybe 30 years ago, three decades ago, it was always poaching because elephants were selectively killed for their tusks, their skin, their hide, their bones. But human elephant conflict is one of the biggest challenges today to, to conserve the Asian elephant and acts as a biggest threat. So it's literally that, you know, they're close to 400 people and at least 100 elephants die each year because of this problem. This is across the country. So at the rate at which we are going with elephants and, and the kind of fragmented home ranges across the elephant range states that they are in, we might look at an epidemic with elephants, you know. And in the places that I study elephants, especially in human dominated areas like that of Bangalore and Tumkur and areas around, we literally lose about 12 people a year. That's like you lose one person every month. Despite the fact that Asian elephants are protected under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act, this is like the wisdom of Mrs. Indira Gandhi when she decided to say that I want to protect the tiger and ultimately all these animals ended up coming into the category of Schedule 1, it receives the highest protection by law. We also realize that when you have forests like Banargata, there are a lot of communities, especially park edge communities that largely farm for subsistence. So there is immense 
anthropogenic pressures on the park largely for collection of forest produce and also because of agriculture because you are cutting off forests converting them into agricultural lands you are you know in some sense breaking the home range so when you break a home range the habitat becomes degraded when you, when it becomes crops elephants tend to create crops so some of the studies that we've done we've identified 18 different seasonal crops that are cultivated and damaged and largely the damage happens when the harvest happens because elephants are smart they like taste just like us so they would end up raiding farms that come into harvest and that's exactly the time that farmers you know also want to harvest the crops because that's what they worked for so in banarkata where i work a marginal farmer has land area of on an average of about 2 acres so 2 acres of ragi you know finger millet which is the predominant crop that is grown so 2 acres of ragi would be about say in an acre you would get probably 15 quintals of ragi pretty much i mean you don't get that anymore because that rainfall pattern is gone so on an average you would get about 12 acres of 12 quintals of ragi so into 2 it's about 24 and one elephant comes and does that the whole well, that's paddy not ragi the entire thing is gone so what happens to the farmer if he's farming for subsistence there's no food his entire food stake is lost for the year so that's equal to poverty okay and and who does this the elephant okay so that is the implications of how it can affect us and maybe we're not aware of it but but because my work is a lot to do with these people it's alarming and these people cannot afford they they daily wage people they end up working for daily wage only to substantiate for the food and the kind of loss that they've gone through next so males have this tendency rather the right word is propensity to uh, engage in conflict which is pretty much going into farmlands raiding crops causing depredation and they can go to extents like which i myself cannot believe like the areas that i study the national park is here they end up going raiding crops more than 200 kilometers operating in an area in 2000 square kilometer which a mother and a calf cannot do right because a mother is always worried about the calf security while for the male there is nothing his only objective is to go eat become big come and show himself to the female you know and then probably get mate selection so we've also seen in cases where our elephants so my elephants tend to cross plantations water bodies roadways railway tracks only to what only to feed only to raise crops and in some cases we've observed uh, where elephants just use forage as a daytime uh, as forest only as a daytime refuge which means they don't do anything they wait till the night sets come out and raid crops this is fantastic you i would see i've seen elephants in coffee plantations in hassan where the elephant entire day is standing in one place and just starving not eating anything i really would see an elephant eating right because it needs about 100 kg of food but this this individual would eat only to wait till the night come out and then you have your biryani you have your mutton fried rice and all that outside so how do they do this and why do they do this and it's pretty interesting to understand that and also it's challenging because the tusker is always in the tight spot because by doing this it's not easy you end up getting killed or you end up getting shot you get to end up you know being captured so there is a risk that you take so is this a high risk that you take for a high gain or do you take no risk to get no gain or do you take low risk to get low gain you know so these are different combinations in which we start thinking as to why these animals selectively males do this next so this is the mysore state highway and this is shot on a cctv camera can you believe this this is not uh, what photoshop edit and it's coming into an orphanage this is very scary actually you have children there you know you have a four and a half ton bull just walking like you know you don't care what happening and then you have this bull there ends up walking on a new and goes boom falls down this was a newly uh, constructed uh, asphalted road in kumbhagod so what we see right now is this uh, crop depredation is pretty much seems like this in villages where i work banana plantations ragi stash papaya we are seeing a shift from that to walking through construction breaking water tanks so what is happening to these elephants i mean is this because there is a change in land use or these elephants have become so rageful that they end up you know doing all of this if you believe in evolutionary psychology so is elephant behavior established through genetics or is it established through social so if i am a crop raider do i teach my son or my son becomes it like i am a thief my son is also a thief or is it because my son's friend is a thief and my son also becomes a thief 
considering that conflict is detrimental for elephants. So I'll be looking at it in that context. So what do we do about this? How do we stop an animal weighing about four tons? In some cases, they go up to five tons, some big bulls that I've seen at least. So what, what do we do? What is, this, what is the forest do? What does the forest department do? What are the stakeholders doing about it? So you have something known as elephant-proof barriers. These are largely physical barrier systems that are in some sense uh, established to curtail movements, especially when they're in a forest, you prevent them into going into human dominant areas in order to avoid any kind of antagonistic relationship or interactions. Next. So you have the elephant proof trench, you have the rubble wall. Next. Then you have the solar fence, which is an electric uh, charged current fence, which gives you a mild shock when you touch it. Then you have the spike pillar, which is next. And then you have the railway line barrier, which is, was first initiated in, in South Africa in Addo National Park. And Karnataka is the first state that ended up adopting this uh, mitigation measure and see what they do. So you have an elephant breaking off the solar fence because they clearly know that the tusks don't conduct electricity and the basal pads don't conduct electricity. And then you have the trench, you slide, it's like a seesaw, you slide, you go out. Then you're walking on roads, you don't care. And then you have the railway line fence, which the elephant is trying to cross next. So this is a bull that we, we, we've been studying for quite some time and he was uh, majorly known uh, to operate outside the forest. I've never seen him in the forest at all, he's always outside. And this is a beautiful video taken by Dilip. So you can see him, that's a solar fence. Just look at his size. Very clearly using his tusk, knowing fully that it won't conduct electricity, doing a closed lip movement because they their trunk tips are very sensitive to anything, so they close it like that because just the rough skin is exposed just in case the wire touches. Using his basal pad again, knowing clearly that it doesn't conduct electricity. So he just breaches that and comes back into the national park after the night of raiding. Like going in the night in a pub and you come back home in the morning, something like that. Okay, so we've also tried some interesting things. We've tried these so-called social barriers because these barriers are very expensive. I'm sure a poor farmer cannot afford that. We've tried experiments like using chili and tobacco, using it at acting as an olfactory deterrent because elephants are very sensitive to smell. And then we have bioacoustic early warning system which predominantly makes alarm calls or sounds that act like threat for elephants. Clearly none of them have worked to a very large extent. Next. So this is a map of Banagara National Park. So that's the boundary and these are elephant proof barriers. So in Banagata we have eight types of elephant proof barrier systems. That's on the left. So if you can see the classification, you have different colors. And then you see on the right, these black dots are breaches, breaks. So we walked across this perimeter, which is about 285 kilometers on foot and tried and understand where these places are and why elephants are coming out. So that's pretty much scary. So literally all the barriers are erected and all the barriers are broken. So we have a total barrier length of about 337 kilometers, which is about 120% more than the park boundary length perimeter itself. And in some places we have a break or a breach per meter in, in, a, in a wildlife range called Kodili. So literally a meter of area would have four breaks, you know. And in some cases we have settlements that are inside, these are called forest villages and those areas elephants again move into these places because they are quite porous. So what am I saying? Am I trying to say that these barriers don't work or do they work? So, based on the study that we've done, we've identified factors that could probably influence porosity in these barriers. One such being natural obstacles, like you have a sheet rock and then you have a railway line, the elephant uses the sheet rock to hop onto the railway line fence, some logic like that. And in cases where solar fences have not been maintained, the electricity comes down, they use areas that are weak. And then you have cattle and wild pig that also cross, they keep because of their constant movement, the, the rocks become weak because of erosion, elephants tend to use that as a weak spot. And so there are multiple combinations in different landscape settings in order for elephants to cognitively decide as to how they can overcome these places. So the God to the Devil mantra is pretty much scary. So when I started my work in Banargata, I used to go to a crop land that was aided by elephants and the farmers would be very happy to say, well, this is Ganesh's blessing, the first crop, let's give it to him. Now if you go and ask him, they'll call it a devil. The menace, it needs to be killed, you know. So this is a study one of my students did. We were looking at perspectives of people. I mean, living with elephants, what is your perspective? What do you think about them? 
Interestingly, there's about 57% of people who still think elephants are good, which means there is still hope, there's still tolerance. But there is a gender variation. Women are less tolerant than men. I'm not making a sexist statement. I don't know why. Because maybe women realize that if the husband is going to guard crops, for all you know, he might be killed that night by a raving elephant. Maybe she's more concerned. And what are the reasons for elephants? Because why, why, why do they feel the elephant is negative? Because they don't get compensation when the elephant, you know, when a cropland is raided, a loss worth 50,000, you get an excretia payment of 3,000. So you're frustrated. Then the very fact that an elephant might raid your crop, the stress itself is something that they're not happy with. You know? So these are probably uh, important indications of how the tolerance levels of communities are, especially when they're abutting elephant landscapes. So let's look at this concept called spatiality versus reality. Okay, So as conservation scientists, we get into this big debate in conferences whether we need to look at landscape level approach or a protected area level approach. Someone says you have to look at a protected area because it's small, it can be managed. And someone says it's landscape that is important because you're talking about genetic viability and things like that. Next. Like I showed you earlier, the, Nilagiri, the Brahmagiri Nilagiri Eastern Ghats landscape. You see Banargata on the on the right at the northern tip. The entire area is filled with elephants. So if an elephant wants to walk from Banargata, it can walk walk up to Kur, probably the shortest distance that it can reach before us. So it's close to six thousand elephants operating in this area alone. How do we manage them? Can we just manage elephants in that small little park? like a so-called zoo and keep them contained or we don't need to look at this entire landscape as a population because genetically it's important to secure the species. Well this is the crop compensation claim for 2013-14. You can see that there is a dip in conflict. So very interesting, you know, I mean if you go to policy makers they'll be very happy. My compensation claims have come down which means it's directly correlated to the levels of conflict. But what is alarming is if you can see the interesting part on, on the right side where you can see a distribution map. So ideally what an elephant would do, it's in a forest, goes out and raids, the farmer claims for compensation, it comes back. That's the normal equation. But in 2013-14, this one year, we saw a dip in claims because elephants were not raiding. And you wondered whether the elephants have just buckled up and just realized that we don't want to raid, can't be possible. What we realized is the elephants have not been in forest at all. They moved away. So the 70% of these elephants home range are outside forest. So if you Look at the yellow layers, these are areas where elephants have never gone, never been reported, 100 years, 200 years, no archival history to say that elephants north of Bangalore from Tumkur and places, if you are there, you probably would have never seen, never heard of elephants as a child, your grandfather would have never seen. But So literally these elephants have left these so called forests which they are technically supposed to belong to because we always believe that wild animals live in forests. But this is not true for, for the elephants that I study, they are away from the protected area, raiding crops in places that have never ever seen elephants. People would see, I remember there was a story when elephants moved into Andhra Pradesh, a population of 25 elephants back 25 years ago moved into Andhra Pradesh from Posu. The chief minister went to welcome the elephant with a banana, you know, saying that well Andhra Pradesh has got elephants and they declared Kaudanya wildlife sanctuary as an elephant sanctuary because of that. So this is Banagata associated with two adjoining landscapes. To the east you have North Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary, on the west you have Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary. So this landscape is pretty much important, it holds about roughly about 500 elephants in a 2000 odd square kilometer area and you see all these dots, these are enclosures. So there is pretty much human domination in these areas, largely causing conflict. So this map I was able to get it from the US, uh, US Army base, it's a map of Banargata in 1954. So you can see that map on the left. Can you see how small Bangalore is that time? The yellow there, 1954. Then look to your right. This is a map from the Forest Department website in 2014. Can you see the red? That's Bangalore. And can you see Banargata in the green? It's almost reduced half its size, perhaps less than half. So if you can take these two analogies, in less than 60 years, pretty much, this landscape has changed. Now 60 years is one elephant's lifetime. They live as long as we do on an average, 60 years. So imagine a calf that was born in 1954, seeing its home tarnished into half. You know, so, so conflict is something that can be thought of inevitable because there is no space. So this is a very much, which is an alarming thing because you see there is so much of agriculture, so much of built up area, so much of uh, land use change that where are these animals supposed to go? You know, there's no space. Let's look at some poster boys of Banargata. This is Linga, this is Siddha, this is Kalinga, 
and this is Ranga. These are not captive elephants, these are white elephants. And like I said, when I said personalities, all of these guys have their own personalities. They have individual needs, they have individual conflict behaviors, they have individual mate selection practices. Well, they have an individual way of life. Next. So I, we call them alliances or I mean I, when I was in Singapore I was talking and someone used this word called bro mass, you know these boys bachelor groups you know hanging out together. So these colors are pretty much indicative of we lost Siddha last year, Ranga has been captured and two of them are still in Banargata very much alive or there in the forest. So when these guys combine with each other they have different ways of behaving. So say Jai Shankar and I go for crop raiding. We probably eat about 100 kgs, but if I go alone, I eat about 20 kgs, you know, because we have probably cooperative groups which which relate based on social learning, you know, where we try and, you know, enforce our identity through something else. So that's pretty much how we operate in society as well. Is nature trying to weed out the dads from the cats, you know, or is the sperm actually cheaper than the egg? Are we trying to literally lose males in a population for certain reasons or are we trying to secure the males in a population for certain reasons if we talk about natural selection and things like that. So this is an elephant family like I explained earlier. So you have the subadult male which after it reaches puberty at around 12 to 13 years it slowly pushed off to go away you know try to find your own mate or try and establish your own bachelor group and things like that. So this male becomes an independent adult which means he is breeding, he is sexually active, sexually mature is the right word and then what he does, he tends to form transient groups which means that he is away from his family, he doesn't know what to do, he doesn't know where to eat. So he tends to join his buddies who are also thrown away. So you might have group 1, group 2, group 3 and both of them disperse these young males outside. They tend to form so called bro mass or the bachelor groups or the male alliances and they tend to form a small family by themselves. And what do they do? So say subadult one joins subadult adult one, adult two, adult three, all these male elephants basically tend to join together next. So this adult remains in that transient group. Obviously for them, if you look at theory of natural selection, they form obviously dominance is achieved by size. In any animal kingdom, the biggest and the strongest win. Now how do you become so big and strong is probably to cooperate because you get bulk food, the forest you have to search all the way but if you go to a ragi patch, maybe in an hour's time you will end up eating about half a ton of food, three, four elephants put together. So they all tend to form these bachelor associations. Only objective is to rate crops largely to improve their body size. Only if they do that can they come back will a female select. So this elephant tends to join with three and they form a bachelor group. So subadult one that dispersed long ago is associated with a new male, maybe an adult male and he tends to learn skills. So I said remember the thought that I had whether it's genetically or socially. So he tends to learn skills of crop raiding, become more bold, no areas, probably acting as scouts to some extent you know trying to look out for new areas to forage next. Okay so he learns the bad trick and then when he becomes an adult he teaches a bad trick to three other people. Okay so this cycle continues. So this is called medio idiosyncrasy which is peculiar behaviors noted in few individuals with the population. And mind you let me not look like I am blaming the elephant to be the bad thing because conflict is just 10% of an elephant's life. So you have the adult male who is now by now an avid crop raider because some of the elephants that I study only crop raid, they only subsist on cropland food. And then you have them raiding crops, they operate in the same areas where other elephants operate in crop raiding or sometimes if they feel that their foraging ground is somewhere else because they act like scouts they look in new areas they end up going. So this is Ranga in the year 1999. So Ranga is a very popular elephant and he was known, uh, known to be associated with rage and violence and terror because a lot of reports of him killing people. In the year 2014 when I remember there was an order issued by the chief wildlife warden for him to be captured. So that was a time that you know elephants from Sakrebail camp from Shimoga were brought in for this whole capture operation and we realized that Ranga was not there. But in 1999 we ended up seeing this photograph which was taken by Mr. Sanjay who was also a conservation scientist. And this was a photo of him in Tumkur. So if you look at the map, Banargata to Tumkur is about 90 kilometers. Okay. How did he go there? Where did he go? He would also clearly see there are two other elephants that are associated in that Arakana plantation. Right? There is one in between on the front on the extreme right and there is here and then him. So remember that schematic representation. So he must have associated with two other bulls okay? and he ended up associating with them, left Banargata 
went into another area, we thought we lost him, but he was very much active crop raiding somewhere else. And then what happened? Those two elephants later, one was captured, one died, Ranga still remained. I'm talking about 1999. And in 2011, we saw him again, look at his size, back at Banalgata. So he's there in his must, full blown, look at his size. I'm sure no other bull would stand next to him. And he gets the mate well, so he gets to mate whoever he wants. And you know, so what has helped him? All his bulk crops outside. And then in 2015, he's with 11 elephants. So if you remember reading one article in Ranga with a gang of 11, He's with 11 bull elephants and all of them are learning how to raid crops from him. <laughs> okay, and he's standing right, so if you can see that Ipomaya, Cornea, bed, if you go to Tumkur and Gubi, you have water tanks that are about 1000 acres in size, they're like oceans literally. And then you have this elephant going there, raiding crops, then, because there's no forest, there's no forest literally, apart from Shitganga and Antraganga areas. So it's only the Ipomaya, Cornea, bed in a large lake, daytime they again starve, Stay in the water, night time, see the coconut plantations around, raid, come back and hide in the water. No one could do anything. Literally, they would stand in the water, raid. And who taught them all of that? Who taught the 10? It's him. So, Banagata National Park is bottom. Look at the routes that they're using. This is crossing two state highways, one railway track. And if you look at the land use, there's no forest that side. It's only agricultural lands, 14 crops. In Banagata, if you have to raid, you get crops only for six months seasonal crops. But if you go to Tumkur, you get crops throughout the year, so you can imagine how much of food. Okay? And see the sites in Tumkur, you have roads with elephant dung, school compound walls broken, raiding up till Tumkur. Now we are having another problem from elephants in Chitradurga, you must have read, you know, elephants coming from, from Badra and, you know, it's a big problem. This is in 2016, this year, you can see someone sitting on him. He still hasn't lost his size. He was captured. Okay? He was finally realized that he was needed to be captured because it was beyond manageable to keep him in that context because there were reports of him killing people and all that. But anyway, we have not seen it so let me not comment on that. But nonetheless, he's captured. Right now, if you want to see him, you go to Matigod Elephant Camp. He's been trained, still eating with the same appetite that he had as a crop raider, eating much more. Then we had this guy, Siddha. I'm sure you must have read about him in the papers, the elephant that broke his leg. So this was a photograph that I took in 2008. A very young, beautiful adolescent bull ended up again for the first time. Aranga used to do this for 20 years, going up and down, going to feed, coming back to mate, go to feed, come to mate. This guy for the first time last year, the year before that, decided, let me also try this. Again, personalities don't match, you know. Maybe what worked for Ranga cannot work for Siddha, right? Remember that video where he slips? Okay, so this is us trying to treat him. We have meloxicam tablets in in, in banana because we thought it was a swelling. We tried as much as we could. He had a very long haul. This was on 30th July 2016. He had a compound fracture on the front foreleg. We sedated him, tried to tranquilize him. His fracture was beyond repair. There were a lot of people trying to give a lot of different suggestions because please understand fractures cannot be treated in elephants. On 9th December 2016, we lost him. You know, because there was septicemia, you can see the right foreleg that was blown. So this is another fabulous breeding bull of Banargata, very close to my heart. I monitored him for about 10 years of my life, lost him to a very stupid instinct of trying to crop rate. So this is the plight of male elephants across the country. So you see, all of them are males, such, such fabulous tusks. You know, all these are genetic traits. They're losing all these animals because of crop rate. So what have we been doing as an organization associated with the Banargata National Park? So we've been doing a lot of scientific exercises uh, to try and understand the population status, something like the dung decay rate experiment, which is pivotal in assessing the elephant population number. We didn't know where elephants were, so we used to do workshops with the frontline staff, people who work in the grassroots, in the forest, largely to empower them to try and understand where elephants are, because only where you know elephants are can you manage them, right? So that's Jay Shankar again training a team of volunteers. We have a lot of volunteers and students who work with us largely on these exercises where you know you bring in scientific temper in order to improve their contribution towards conservation. A lot of training programs for people, outreach exercises on scientific methods, conflict management and things like that in order to empower people who are actively contributing to uh, elephant management and conservation. Then of course the assessment of the railway line barrier, we do this every five years. So if you guys want to have a long walk, long walk come with us, you we'll probably walk the longest 20, 280 kilometers try and understand where these areas elephants are and what can be done to prevent them from raiding crops. Next. 
awareness and outreach, which we haven't really been effectively doing it in the city, but again, reaching out to schools, colleges, children to try and, you know, bring in this knowledge to them because they're not very far from Bangalore and it's imperative that they contribute to the efforts that are taken. Well, we also do a little bit of uh, XC2 treatment. This was Siddha again when he had his tail being bitten off by another elephant. Tail biting is a very common thing when elephants are sparring. So for the first time we tried to treat it, you know, by giving it some antibiotics and that was a fantastic recovery. Unfortunately, we lost the animal itself, but the tail was bitten, we published a paper. Uh, so something like this, when elephants get into injury or, you know, some anthropogenic reasons or natural way to try and do some kind of uh, treatment next. And what most importantly is the people of, of, of Banagata, the package communities, it's important to sensitize them, at least go to them and reach because sometimes in my work I'm stuck between two people, one villages on one side and the forest department on the other side, both of them cannot stand each other. So I end up in some sense facilitating that dialogue. So that's Dilip again talking to a lot of villagers, trying to understand their challenges, how we can work cooperatively to solve this problem because in no way you can remove the elephants. I mean, they, they have the right of life as much as we do. So somewhere we need to balance that argument. We have a lot of students who come from different universities, different institutions, and we conduct these small research projects, trying trying to look at specific concerns, like looking at perspective, looking at looking at economics of conflict. These ultimately help management managers to take right decisions, especially the forest department, to try and empower them to take the right decision, primarily with the information that has scientific temper. And of course the railway line fence, which was again, I mean, We've been erected in Banagata National Park, the second in the state of Karnataka that was after Ilo, this is the only place that has it. So we were able to establish this and because of, us, because of our recommendations in certain areas, elephants don't move into villages. And trying out different ways, like someone said chili plantation, tiger urine, beehive fencing, all these are different ways because you're dealing with a cognitively intelligent species. So you need to come up with different ways to deter them in order to try and you know, prevent conflict at least in that area, not to make it a landscape phenomenon, but can localize conflict to certain areas. So the, the study that I am part of is the longest study on Asian elephants in Banagata National Park and that long term data has been collecting. So we've been monitoring individuals, population, looking at trends, looking at mortality, looking at natality. Gives you a sound understanding of how the population can be managed at the long run. And capture taming, yes, that's Ranga and Akral. We ended up I have no option but to capture him. So monitoring him, ensuring that his welfare in captivity is, is right, the right food intake is given to him. So this was a project that was given to us. We did this for about six, seven months. Dilip was again a very active part of that. And dry season, drought, like I said, seasonality is a very important concern in forest ecosystems. We have drought. Last year was a severe drought in Banangata. So we ended up creating troughs. And that's a camera trap image of elephants actually using that water. And we also use technology, like I said, especially camera trapping. I think many of you you know, we use camera traps to monitor elephants in areas where they're bound to come, especially to try and reinforce whether our study animals are using this area, that area, why it's happening, what they're eating, and see what they do to camera traps. It's an infrared light, you can't even see a flash. Through. Camera traps are invaluable sometimes because they're non-invasive, because otherwise when we're in the forest, animals can detect us. But camera traps, you know, covertly do that job, but sometimes they go through this problem. So this is a, a report that we had written in the 1st of December uh, to the Chief Wildlife Warden, uh, uh, largely a short note on human elephant conflict, looking at excretia compensation, erecting elephant proof barriers next, improving quality of habitats like dry season management and encouraging scientific research on human elephant culture. We're looking at conflict not just from a sense of negative interaction between people and elephants or people and wildlife in general, but there are a lot of things associated with it. Okay. So, I'll just end by a quick story. I was in Tumkur once and uh, again monitoring my elephants there and I ended up visiting a family which had apparently lost a son and I wasn't aware I was in that village. And this was at around 8 o'clock in the morning. Tumkur again, not an elephant habitat, no elephants around, but these gang of 11 ended up using that area. A child about 8, 9, 10 years around, wearing a school bag, walking on a cart road, you know, uh, you know, getting ready to school, the father was a daily wage, mother's a handicap, so the male child, you know, the male child value, right? He, so every, the, the kind of resources that the family were thought of was to primarily ensure that he studies and so that they, he can be the breadwinner of the family. Eight o'clock in the morning, walking on the road, a three-ton bull comes and rams him. Okay, he dies. And I ended up going in that house and talking to that mother. The forest department will give you a compensation, about five lakhs. And probably they'll say, that's it. 
And talking to this lady, I realized, having worked for elephants 10 years, being on this side of the fence, trying to say, save elephants here, I begin to think from the other side of the fence. You know, because if you want these animals to survive, you need people. And there has to be a dialogue. So how would you justify the loss for that mother? Is this bilax justifiable to put, on a, put a value to that child's life? No. So human-elephant conflict today is all of that. It's poverty, it's loss of a young one, it's loss of an elephant, so there's a lot of things. And in today's society, we put value to everything, we love putting value to everything. So the economic value, what is the value of a tree? So can we posit an intrinsic value to human-elephant conflict today? Okay, with that I will end. Thank you so much.